picking up in part two of last week's message that we gave to you on two sons and one father. So if you have your Bible, if you go ahead and get that out tonight, I'm excited about picking up in this. I mentioned before, I tell you, the Lord's taken me out of my comfort zone here. I'm not used to these part series deals, uh, but at least the Lord knows my heart. I'm not getting on the internet trying to find some little certain, the little thing and cheaping out and not really seeking the Lord. It's not like that at all. So uh, a little different for me, but... And you know what's even stranger is I turn this from part one to part two, and I, and I have to tell you, there's going to be a part three. <laughs> praise God, but praise the Lord. You, you won't have to deal with that too often, I'm just telling you. Now, do, whether we get to do it next Thursday, I can't promise you, because uh, the Lord's will is so much more important to me than anything else. But if you have your Bible tonight, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, and as we look into the remaining life lessons from this New Testament parable that Jesus gave us, what we're going to be doing as we go through this, we will be searching for the practical wisdom that is revealed through each and every verse within the story. And what we want to do through life lessons is apply these to our own life in December of 2022. Now, for those of you watching online or maybe here, you're a teacher, you're a preacher, and you've heard me say before that I encourage people to do what I call life lessons. You can call them anything you like. Why do I do that? And uh, on the way to church tonight, I was giving it some more thought. Eventually, I plan to put all these, Lord's will, into a book series, uh, and I'd like to be able to give them to other people to utilize. I've even had people reach out to me and say, hey, do you mind if we use this? whether it be in an outreach ministry or a church or whether it be in a, uh, a teaching of a Sunday school. And I've said, yes, eventually I plan to put these in a book. But what's the reason why that I say uh, that it's so much easier to teach and preach? Well, I personally believe that doing this in this manner, if nothing else, is going to make you a better teacher and preacher because of the discovery process. Because every time that you analyze each and every verse through every text and story, the, the discovery process itself will teach you to be a better analyst and a deliverer of what you have found in the Word of God. Those of you that teach or preach, you'll get that. Other folks are just like, okay, just get on with the message tonight. Amen. But if you miss part one, uh, I just want you to know you can always go back and listen to part one and pick up where we've left off, and I encourage you to do that. But I want to try to preach this in such. Anybody ever watch a movie part two or part 15 or something, and you're like, man, if you didn't see part one, you probably will have no clue as to what's going on. I want to try to preach this in such a way that even if you miss part one, that you'll still get something out of it. So uh, for time constraints, I'm, I'm only going to be able to read up to verse 28, and I had to do the same thing last week. I just don't want you to be here till 2 o'clock in the morning. And to be honest with you, I don't want to be here to 2 anyway unless the Holy Ghost moves. So Luke chapter 15, verse 17, and when you got it, say Amen. All right, for the folks who couldn't make it tonight, you're joining us online. God bless you. For our faithful followers, I love you guys as well. Uh, drop us a line. Send us a message on the Internet. We always enjoy knowing that folks are listening. Verse 17 says this, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Verse 18, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose. And came to his father, but when he was a, yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck. Can you see that in your mind? 
am running to embrace his lost son who's come home and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son, somebody say was, was dead and is alive again. He was lost. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Let's pray tonight one more time. Father, we love you tonight for the word of God's sake. We're asking you, Lord, to let the word be brightened in our mind to to lighten all of the concealed areas and maybe things we haven't discovered or understood about your word because I believe that you have given us the word so that we can understand it, that we have knowledge. And I want us to grow by it. I want us to know it. I want us to live by it. And I pray, God, that you will do exactly that. As a minister of the gospel, I pray that you'll use me tonight according to your perfect will. And let everyone that hears this have better understanding and clarity than ever before. And let it draw them to you. Let them work on the weak areas of their life, God, that they may perfect that which is falling apart. And I pray, God, tonight that everything that we do and say, you will receive glory for all that is good and done. In Jesus' name, everyone can say amen. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So I must drop back just a little bit so that we make sure we don't forget where we left. That's the problem or the difficulty, should I say, with doing a different part is sometimes you can lose the energy and sometimes you can lose the very spirit of what you were on a hot trail of before. And I don't want to do that. So I want to recap some of last week so that we understand the direction. In summary, we have one father and we have two sons. We have mentioned that already. And the youngest of the son, he requests that his father would give him his inheritance, and he wants it early, earlier than he would have expected to get it. After he gets his inheritance, the Bible shows us that he goes into a far country. He wastes the inheritance that his father had given him, and inconvenient to him after all the money is spent, and he has nothing to live off of, nothing to have uh, uh, to his benefit, if you will, He comes to a point where in this far country, they come into a time of famine, so convenient. Then he is able, the Bible shows us through this parable that Jesus gave, that he's able to secure a job in this other country. And as one preacher I heard mention this, one thing you can commend the boy for, at least he was looking for a job. Come on, somebody, and say, man, some people just lay around, will never get a job. But he found a job in this far country, and unfortunately for him, it is the lowest job on the pole, if you can say it that way, feeding the hogs. And while he is in this low place, you remember last week we mentioned how that nobody gave to him. When he had plenty of money, everybody's at your right side. But when you run out of money and you're running with the wrong kind of people, They don't want anything to do with you. You were there for them, but will they be there for you? That's a great question. So if we were to unpause where we left off last week, we would see a young man who is about to have a revelation as a result of everything, first of all, that he has gone through. We're about to see a young man that's going to have a revelation of everything we talked about last week, everything he went through, and second of all, everything that he's taken for granted. How many of you agree that from what we read last week that this young man has taken some things for granted? 
Anybody believe that? You ever see somebody go through a wake-up call that God allows them to go through? And a lot of it has to do with what they've taken for granted and the right system ours. Not just that, but all the people who were not there by their choice. Now, when the Holy Ghost brought this to my attention, I Man, I thought to myself, I wish I had more time to preach this out because this is a sermon within a sermon. Listen to me. All the people who were not there by their choice. The reason that is important, you see, is the people that were back home and not in his life was because of his choice. But the people in the far country were not in his life because of their choice. Did anyone get that? Think of that for a moment. Hopefully that's not too deep to wrap yourself around. In other words, the people that are back home, they are not in his life, not because they didn't want to be in his life, but he cut them out of his life. It was by his choice. But now he's in a place of his life that we realize that the people that are around him, they're not in his life because of their choice. You know, and there's a lot to be said about that. And again, I wish I had time. But think about the fact that there are people that would love to be in your life, but because you cut them out of your life, that's why they're not there. If you got anybody you love who cut you out of their life, you'd love to be a part of it. But it's not because you don't want to be. It's because they cut you out of their life. Oh, God, send revelation to them. Can you say amen? So, when we look at the Word of God, the Bible says, uh, Jesus told us that he came to himself. And then after he comes to himself, we realize that he weighs out the differences between back home and being away from home. I believe that there's a lot to be said about the fact that when you are in that position, you're weighing out the difference of where you used to be the way things used to be and the way things are right now where I'm at. Has anyone ever been in a place and thought, man, I wish I was back where I was at before because this is miserable. Have you ever moved somewhere and thought, man, I wish I lived where I used to be? Say amen, somebody. Then he makes up his mind to apologize to his father before he has even left the far country. You see this young man, and I don't know what he was doing, running a rake, a hoe through the, through the hog pen or maybe pouring some slop into the trough. I don't know exactly what he was doing, but in my mental picture, I get a picture of this young man working in the slop of the trough, and he's coming up with a plan in his mind. I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to apologize to my dad. And uh, this was even before he even left. He's already talked about this in his mind. But he also makes up his mind that he is willing to go back as a servant in a royal place. He's willing to take up the lowest place and position. He's already committed in his mind to those details. So with a well thought out plan, he gets up and he goes back home. When he is nearing his father's property, the Bible shows us that the father sees him way off in the distance. And the father breaks out in a run and comes to him and embraces him with great joy and kisses him on the cheek. And he begins to, the young son begins to follow through with the plan that he had way back in the hog pen. And he begins to apologize, Sister Kim, to his father. The father says to those around about him and says, bring the very best robe and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. You know, I don't know if I'll get around to bringing this out, but that stood out to me. Think about this, folks. He went out blessed of his father. He's in such bad shape when he comes home, he ain't even got shoes on his feet. That's pretty bad stuff whenever you ain't got shoes. Can you imagine working in a hog pen without shoes? That's some bad stuff right there. You traveling all the way from a far country back home without shoes on your feet. Man, I'm telling you, I wish I had time to preach all of these awesome nuggets out. But the Bible then goes on to show us that the father throws what I'm gonna call a great celebration. Maybe some would call it a party with feasting and festivities. And it's right there that we'll have to stop because time will uh, fail that us to be able to preach it all out. 
And so I realized that that is a rather lengthy portion of story there. And this is why that I had no choice but to break this down into two and three parts. But I want us to take a step back tonight and look at the life lessons that this story shows us in every one of these verses that we have talked about tonight. If we look back and reflect in verse number 17, the life lesson, number one life lesson that the Holy Ghost gave me is the difference between broke down and broke through starts when we realize it for ourselves. Let me say that again. The first life lesson is the difference between broke down and broke through starts when we realize it for ourselves. Listen to what the Bible said and when he came to himself he said how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger did anybody else catch the part there where he said the bible said and he said How many hired servants? You know, 10 different people can tell you the same different thing. Honey, if you hang around with that crowd, if you invest money in that, 10 different people can tell you 10 different ways, basically the same thing. But I've come to know that in life uh, that there are some things until you realize it for yourself. No, you're not going to believe anybody else. Uh, And so I'm telling you tonight uh, that the difference between us being broke down and having a breakthrough sometimes is when you finally realize it for yourself. The preacher's been trying to tell you, but until you're standing in court, you may not realize it for yourself. Until you're broke, you may not realize it for yourself. Until you're spiritually bankrupt and you got no oil in your lap, you may not understand until you finally have an epiphany yourself. Until you finally wake up one day and come to yourself. Now you may be upset right now because someone's not heeding your advice. You tried to warn them, saint. You tried to tell them. And you tried to say, listen, don't do that. And you sit back and you watch them messing up their life. Oh, but let me tell you, as they're headed in the right, wrong direction, pray that they come to themselves because there are some things you will drive yourself mad trying to tell them. There have been times that I preached the truth and I preached it so clear, so precise, with such an anointing, I was sure the altars were gonna fill up and they were finally gonna change their life. But I'll tell you what you gotta do, you gotta do, whether it's a brother, a cousin, a friend, or an aunt, or an uncle, or a co-labor at work, you gotta pray God let them realize it for their self. Help them to understand the, how nasty and how dirty that sin is for their self. Help them to realize how vile that perversion is for themselves. Uh, help, help them to realize the direction they're headed for themselves. Help that daddy to realize how he's misleading and mistreating his, his children for himself. Help that mama to understand uh, she's neglecting the most important principles for herself. Help those sinners to understand the path they're on for their self. Because I can assure you, the moment that that bell starts ringing for themselves and they come to you, they're going to say, Mama, I never realized how vile I was. I didn't realize how deadly it was to mess around with some of those things I was messing around with. I didn't realize how gross and how ungodly that it was. But oh, the moment that he came to himself. Oh, there's some difference between us being broke down and broke through. And it has so much to do that we realize it for ourselves. Oh, I would to God that there were people that I could just open up the top of their mind, take a jug of understanding and pour it right on in. But there are people that are never going to learn it till they figure it out and come to themselves. Oh, that God would begin to let things unfold. There are people that may turn their back on you and you say, if they only knew I love them, if they only realize that I'm for them, they may never understand till they realize it for themselves. 
who's for them and who's against them. When that young son left home, his father knew that he was the one that would be there when everything fell apart. That father knew that he loved him more than anybody else loved him. That father knew that he would give him things that he may even waste, but he gave it anyway. His father knew that one day his hopes was that son would realize where his bread was really buttered and realize who really loved him. Maybe your family has rejected you. Maybe others have forsaken you. But all you can do when you lay down at night and pray, God help them to come to themselves and realize for themselves they need this. Say amen, somebody. And it's life lesson number two taken for verse number 18. The right plan is the first step to restoration. You know, there's no backdoor plan. There's only the right way to do things. You're not going to mislead or manipulate your way back to the Father's house. There's a right plan. And that's why it worked for him. It's not like calling dad on the phone and saying, yo, dad, what's up, man? Oh, not much. You know, things are not too great around the farm here, and your mama's not been feeling well. Yeah, it sounds to me like you could really use some help over there. I mean, you want me to come, you want me to come home, Dad? Is that what you're trying to tell me? That that is not the approach that young man took. He was not trying to mislead or manipulate his way back home, but he came up with the right plan. Somebody say the right way. But he came up with the right plan. If you want restoration, you got to have a right plan. The Bible said in verse 18, he says, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. You ever meet these folks that they want restoration without ever saying, you know, I messed up. I'm just telling you tonight that the easiest way to get the best kind of restoration between you and God is to say, Lord, I fell flat on my face and I'm sorry for what I've done. Say amen. Oh, that's right. He was committed to the details before he ever left the mess of the hog pen. What that means to me is, is that while he is, I don't know, raking slop, while he is uh, wading around with no shoes and hog slop and hog manure, trampling around in filth and ungodly, uh, vile uh, feces of uh, those uh, hogs there, he's thinking in his mind, I know what I'll do. I'm committed. I know what I'm going to get up and I'm going to go back. I'm going to make the long trip. Shoes or no shoes. Uh, uh, clothes stinking dirty. I, it doesn't matter. My dad might reject me, but that's a, that, that's a chance I'm willing to take. I'm willing to go all the way to make that long trip. My brother may not want me there. The other people may not want me there, but it doesn't matter what they want. I want to know, does my daddy still want me back home? Uh, but I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up, uh, and I'm going to. Somebody say, going to. He had already started thinking what he was going to do before he ever did. And then number three, humility. In this life lesson number three, humility is the purest form of genuine remorse. Did anybody hear what he said in verse 19? I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. You see, this boy realizes uh, what he deserves uh, and he's willing to take the lowest position in the father's estate. He understands he messed up. He's not going back in with a, his, his uh, chest poked out, bristled up like I deserve to be here. He's going back with pure humility. When you fall on your face, you better be humble when you approach God. If you really want mercy, you better be humble. If you want restoration, you better be humble. You better better not go back with an attitude uh, demanding this and demanding that. Go back and willing to start at the bottom if you got to. He was willing to take the lowest estate and lowest position. Listen, the Bible says restore them that have been taken in a fault. Isn't that what the Bible says? But I want to show you something. We are living in a day 
When you've got preachers and teachers and leaders that blatantly sin and do the wrong thing, fall on their face, and then when church folks expect them after they have fallen to go and get cleaned up or go and get counseling or go and sit on a church pew for a while, they will demand to get right back up in the pulpit. How many of you believe there are some situations where a man or a woman who has fallen, they need to go somewhere and get better before they try to tell everybody else how to do better? Come on now. Oh, there's a humble way of doing things. And until you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, you will not see him exalt you in due time. Say amen. Sadly, even recently, I have watched as pastors make some of the most foolish decisions. And then when all the cards in the deck fall, instead of taking responsibility where responsibility should be taken, they put the blame squarely on something else or the church. That's not humility. Come on now. When a husband and wife can't see eye to eye, and they bicker and fight back and forth, not being willing to, to humbly admit that there are missteps. All of us have to do that. It doesn't matter if it's me or you or anybody else. All of us have got to do that. Say amen, somebody. But if you're got, if you, uh, number four, life lesson that I get from verse number 20, you got to get up and go back if you want things to get better. You got to get up and go back if you want it to get better. Get up, go back if you want it to get better. He stood around that hog's pen working, coming up with a plan of what he was going to do. You know how many times I've had somebody tell me, Pastor Myers, I know what I need to do. I know we need to get back in church. You ever had a family member tell you that? I know we need to get back in church. I know I need to get right with the Lord. I've got people that call me pastor, and I haven't seen them in three and four years, and they still call me pastor. I don't know. That's kind of a strange pastor relationship. I still love you. But, it, but a real pastor, you're going to be up under the watch of that shepherd, not out there doing your own thing randomly. Oh, no. But there are people that they will admit, you know, I know what I need to do, but they never do what they need to do. This man come up with a plan in the hog's pen. I will arise and I'll go to my father. I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned and I'm no more worthy to be called thy servant. It's good to come up with a good plan and a right plan, but if you never get up and you never make the trip and you never go back home, it'll never get any better. Say amen. Verse number 20 said, and he arose. Somebody said he arose and came to his father. You know what he did? He followed through with his plan. He made good on what he planned to do. That's like saying, you know what? Sunday morning I'm going to church. And when I get there, I'm going down to the altar and I'm praying. First of all, you don't got to wait till you get to church. But you understand what I'm saying. I'm going to church Sunday morning. I'm getting my family together. We're going to get all our clothes together on Saturday night. So Sunday morning, we ain't got a thousand excuses why we can't go and, and all this sort of things. You know, as soon as you try to do what the Lord's been dealing with you to do, you know, the devil's going to try to stop you from going to church. You can already know that. Your husband is going to be mad about something because there's a fly landed on his spaghetti noodle or something. There's going to be something wrong. Somebody's going to be mad about something. The car's going to be half out of gas or something's going to be wrong. You just got to expect that something might go wrong. But if you got your mind made up and you come up with a plan, my Lord, follow through with your plan. Say amen. Let me ask you a question. How many, how many times... Have you possibly gone down to the altar and you said, Lord, I'm going to change this and I'm going to stop doing that. And Lord, you know I messed up, but you show me mercy. But I'm going to get up and I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop going there. I'm going to stop talking about that. I'm going to... And you never, you never arose and went to the Now, you had good plans, but you never followed through. Good intentions are great, but following through with your intentions is the best path to restoration. 
Because you can sit down and map out how to become a millionaire. But if you never invest, if you never buy, sell, or take risk, you'll never make a dollar. If you never get out of bed and go to work, you never make no money. I've been working on a message in the background and I've preached around about it before. But how many of you remember the woman with an issue of blood? The Bible said that she had had that bloody issue for 12 long years. But one day when the master came through town and she got wind through the crowd that this man, uh, this master healing Messiah was in town, the Bible said that this woman who wasn't even supposed to be around common people because of the, the disease or the problem she had, she got out of bed. I don't know how she did it. She was probably weak in body. I see her on her hands and knees. I don't know how she was. But how many of you know that she couldn't just lay in the bed and, and say, yeah, somebody send Jesus over here. She got out of bed and she left the house and went to where he was at. You want something? Go after it. Can you say that with me? Go after it. You need a better marriage. You need peace in your mind. You need an answer about a problem. You need peace within a bad relationship. Ask for it and go after it. You can come up with a plan how you're going to write a letter and apologize. You can come up with a way that you're going to say it whenever you finally get around to saying it. But sometimes you just got to get up and go do what you know you've been thinking about doing. Don't wait till you're on your deathbed. You might not even make it to where you have the conscience mind to even do it. If you need to make right, make right now. Say amen. Number five lesson, five life lesson from the text, verse 20. He is not waiting to beat you. He is waiting to greet you. I said he's not waiting to beat you. He's waiting to greet you. How do you figure, Pastor Myers? The Bible said he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, I want you to understand the father wasn't sitting up on the front porch of the, the family farm waiting until the boy walked up on the porch. As soon as he saw that boy had intention to come home, I see him break out in a stride and go running down the farm dirt road. Wrap his arms around that boy and say, I love you, son. Come on back home. Somebody say, thank God for that. He is not waiting to beat you. He is waiting to greet you. You know, there is this sentiment sometimes that because I've messed up and sometimes multiple times, we're not sure what to expect. Let me tell you what people fear. They don't always fear so much what the pastor's going to say. And some don't even really fear so much what God says because they believe God's merciful. You know what some folks are more afraid of than anything? They're afraid about what everybody's going to say when they get back home. How's the church folks going to treat me? I just preached a truth to you. Do you know there are people tonight that if they knew that they could come back to the Father's house... And they wouldn't be trampled on and treated like an outright outcast. Huh? Until they line up with every little I dotted and T crossed that everybody has a, a certain quota and all that. When you become one of us. I'm telling you, they, there are some that would have more motivation to even give consideration to walk into the house of God. If they knew that they would be greeted instead of beaten. Because here's what you understand. We will one day, we face him today as a lamb. But one day we're going to face him as a lion in judgment. It's a lot better to face him in the altar prayer as a lamb than it is to wait till the day of judgment and face him as a lion. But what he's wanting to do is to prove to people that have messed up, fell by the wayside, Fallen in the quicksands and the mire and muck of life. He wants them to understand. I paid a heavy price so that you could come back to the Father's house. Say amen, somebody. He's not waiting to beat you. He's waiting to greet you. Life lesson number six from the text in verse 21. If you want a breakthrough, you got to follow through. 
I touched on that a little bit, but verse 21 said, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight am no more worthy to be called thy son. I want you to see two pictures. If this was a movie, I'd want you to capture a freeze frame of two scenes of the movie. Part one, you see him in the hog's pen walking around imagining himself saying, Father, I've sinned in thy presence and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hearts. He's he's thinking about it in one scene. In another scene, He followed through with what he thought he would do. And here he is. He's at the opportune time. Walk barefoot through rocks and thickets and who knows what to get home. Finally, he's in the embrace of his father. He steps back and looks his father in the whites of his eyes. And through tears, he says to him, Father, I have sinned. I have sinned and in thy sight I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. He followed through. Everything he imagined to do, he did it. That's like that person that says, I'm going, I'm going to give my life to God. That's like that saint that says, I've been telling God that I'm going to start an outreach ministry. That I've been telling God I'm going to pursue the calling that he's got on my life. I've been telling God I came up with a plan how I would do it, but I've yet to follow through. Do you see, the greatest outcome is contingent on the simple fact that in two scenes of this story, one, he comes up with a plan, and two, he follows through with it. That is the common denominator for a lot of people. It is the difference of sitting under conviction. You ever watch somebody do that in church service? Now, see, I've been preaching a while, so I've seen people do it. I've seen them worm and squirm all over the pew. Get up, go to the bathroom, pass the baby, pick up a book, and try to act like they don't hear what the preacher's saying. I've seen the look on their face and under conviction. I've even had people tell other folks that invited them to church, I'm not going back to your church anymore. And they said, why not? They said, because when Pastor Myers was preaching, he's looking straight at me. All that is is conviction because I'm not purposely looking at any particular person. I'm just looking around the room. Some folks, you say, I'm looking at you. Well, you know, you're looking at me too. You know what I mean? Huh? This thing's working both ways now, ain't it? And so uh, it's just that's the way it works. And so, you know, if you're under conviction, there's a reason. And if you're sitting in the opportune time to to follow through and let God have his way in your life, I'm just telling you tonight, quit making excuses. Uh, If you want a breakthrough, you got to follow through. you got to follow through. If you come to church with all intentions of giving your life to God, do it. You're planning to go to church the same way you've been planning to go to church? You're listening online maybe for months. What are you waiting on? If you want a breakthrough, you got to follow through. Somebody say amen to that. Number seven life lesson. The rewards of doing what's right is his way of saying, I forgive you for what was wrong. Did you catch that? I'm going to read it again. The rewards of doing what's right is his way of saying, I forgave you for what was wrong. What did he say in verse number 22? For the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hands and shoes on his feet. Those were all rewards that he did not deserve. But the rewards of doing what's right is his way of saying, I forgave you for what was wrong. When you start seeing doors opening up and prayers being answered, and you start questioning, well, maybe God didn't forgive me. Do, do you need to stop for a moment of reflection on all God has done? Because the rewards are his way of saying, I forgave you for what was wrong. Say amen, somebody. Number eight, life lesson. The father openly celebrates what others would rather conceal. I like that. 
the Father openly celebrates what others would rather conceal. Verse 22 and verse 20, 23 and verse 24. Listen to what it says. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. You see, there was a celebration that he was not trying to conceal behind closed doors. They were having a celebration that all these people are a part of and involved in. Do you realize tonight that uh, those who attended the celebration would know? Because why are we celebrating? Because uh, Steve messed up and, and he came back home. Because in the celebration, you can't have the celebration without the, the first, the knowledge that the reason why we're having to do this is because he made a dumb decision. There are people that would rather conceal the most powerful part of a testimony is the part where you messed up. What good is, is mercy if mercy cannot be applied to a mess up? Huh? When you mess up and you fess up and you got God wiping away the slate. There's reason to celebrate. Some people want to keep it hush hush. I'm just keep it in the family. Don't tell anybody that she slept around with somebody and had a baby out of wedlock. That's a mark of shame against this family. Back up, sister and brother. It is what it is. The damage has already been done. Celebrate the mercy. Celebrate the home going and the homecoming. Celebrate what God has fixed. Where they went out, they used to be Holy Ghost filled and, and they left the church and now they're covered with tattoos and got holes and dragged piercings in their ears and all kinds of things passed them out. We don't want a bad rap. We don't want people to look at our kids crazy. Let me tell you, the damage is already done. Don't worry about concealing it. God's not worrying about concealing it. What God's doing is God is healing it. And no need to conceal it because God's done healed it. Say amen. The Father openly celebrates what others would rather conceal. I'm not talking about doing like some, some people do with their sins. Yeah, back in the day, I was part of a motorcycle gang. And boy, we go in the bar room, we'll bust some heads up. It's bad. See that tattoo right there? That's where I knocked a guy out. That tattoo. I got the guy's his teeth went right there in that, that, that little scar. That's where his teeth went. I, I did that right there and bust his teeth out with my muscle. Yeah, back in the day, I used to be bad. I'd take beer bottles and bust them over people's head. And one time, I had a guy bleeding so severely, he nearly died. And uh, You know, some people, they're not trying to testify. They're trying to brag. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody who humbly is not trying to consider seal the person they used to be. Yes, I was an alcoholic. Yes, I was a meth addict. I had sores all over me. Yes, I was a town drug dealer or drunk. Yes, I ran around and slept around and I'm not proud of that. But God healed it so there's no reason to conceal it. God fixed it. Say amen somebody. Anybody besides me glad for the power of grace. Somebody give God praise tonight. Amen. I'm telling you, I'm going to try and close, bring this airplane into the runway on that. And we'll have to pick up on the latter part of this story. My Lord, I wish we could just go right on along. But this is where we're going to have to find our landing gear tonight. I want us to be reminded of such value through this one story. How many of you say, I didn't realize there was that much meat in that one story. And there's even more than that. What we all have to understand, uh, like I heard someone say not long ago, if you look at the summary of the story of the prodigal son and the father and the other's resident son uh, that I call him, uh, you look at that story, it basically is this. It is a son that left home. Amen. A father, that son that got sick of home. A son that got sick away from home. And a, and a son that decided to come home. That's really the story in a nutshell. But how many of you said, I was once that son. I was once that daughter. But I'm glad that he let me come back to the father's house. 
I just want you to understand as we stand our feet across the house of the Lord, maybe you're here tonight, you say, well, I didn't do as much mess as they did. I didn't do as much wrong as they did. Or maybe you're here and you say, man, I feel like Paul. I'm like chief among sinners. You don't even want to hear part of my story. It's so bad. I'll be running off. I'll be running off criminals that have been saved and people that was in a drug cartel if they heard my story. I just want you to understand it doesn't matter the volume of how severe that it was as much as that God has loved you enough to honor your willingness to come forward and meet him in the driveway of the Father's house. In a lot of ways, I read this and I thought to myself, how strange. That it just proves what I have said in the past. I heard a preacher not long after I got saved make a statement. He said, I believe that it's possible for someone to get saved when they step out before they ever get to the altar. I thought about that over the years. And I take that a little bit further and I say, the very commitment that you make in the hog pen, I know what I'm going to do. Could it be you're either saved or well on your way to being saved the moment that you commit to the details, I will arise. I'm going to go to the Father's house and I will be saved. Is it possible to be saved before I even kneel down and pray? I can tell you this much. That I know not, but I do know this. I do know that you are well on your way to where you need to be when you start making the right plans and you follow through with those plans. I wonder tonight if maybe any part of this message has dealt with you. Maybe in some way, maybe there are some areas of your life. You say, well, I'm already saved, but there's some things I haven't quite followed through with. If that's you tonight... I want you to take a sincere effort between you and the Lord and find a place, whether it's at your seat or in the altar. And I want you to get down before God and I want you to say, Lord, forgive me for the area of slackness. I know there's a calling on my life. Or I know that I'm supposed to be doing something and I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Forgive me. Show me mercy. I keep talking about what I'm going to do and I just never follow through with what I say I'm going to do. You know, a little boy, he looks across the classroom and he sees that pretty little girl on the other side of the classroom. One day I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a love note and I'm going to give that little girl a love note. I'm going to ask her to be my girlfriend. But a month turns into two months, the three months, and before he looks around and his best friend beats him to the punch. huh? I'm just telling you, procrastination can cost you whenever you're not doing what you're supposed to. And the sad part is, is that procrastination can cost other people close to you. As you bow your head across the house of the Lord tonight, I want you to consider if that's you, if there's anything tonight that you need to take before the Lord and say, God, work it out. Work in me, work on me, work through me. I got some kinks and some bugs I need to work out in my life, Lord. Surely you know I've got some rough edges that need to be smoothed. I've got some areas and things I need to work on, and I'd like to start in the altar tonight, the best place you could start, church. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord to be with us. I ain't got any fancy music to play for you, but I believe we can pray without music if we need to. Come on, let's seek the Lord.